Yeah, welcome. Thank you so much for having me here today. Thank you, Maxon, for inviting me. It's always a pleasure in this very lively environment to talk about uh, creative things. <laughs> uh, I'm going to talk about this piece here now, which you also can see on some of the screens on the side, uh, which is the release piece that was created this summer as an accompanying uh, campaign for Maxon Cinema 4D release R20. Uh, the title of this piece is called Influencers, and I'm going to run you through a little bit of the making of, of how it was created and how it happened to be. Uh, when we talk about influencers, it's kind of a term from the advertising language that kind of describes these people who have a big following, who have some sort of influential position in the, in the advertising world and can be used to communicate a certain message or sell their product or anything like that. Uh, Zeitgeist, you could consider, is a little bit of an influential character in the animation industry and the 3D world. Uh, it's a studio in Berlin, and they are one reason why I'm here today. Zeitgeist was founded 17 years ago by Henrik Mauler and Jamie Raab, and uh, made quite a big mark in the art world and the 3D world as well. And I give, want to give you a very brief background so you also can understand why this piece looks like how it looks like and what we do, what our work is, uh, and also why I'm talking more about creative processes here today rather than technical demonstrations. So some of the imagery that Zeitgeist is creating is, is very abstract. We're working a lot with uh, simulations, like cloth simulations, but we also always try to create designs that are, that are quite special and quite unique and create visuals that have not really been seen before. Uh, and these are some of the excerpts of the works of the last years. Um, this was also an anim animation piece a few years ago, which is called Birds, which was quite successful. Um, Badlands, one of my personal favorites. And currently, we're also transi transitioning a bit f away from the virtual 3D space into product design and fashion development. Like these are uh, bags that we actually produced together with a Japanese um, fashion designer, Toshiki earlier this year, and they are all generative, like these bubbles are actually generated by an algorithm in 3D, and then they are, they are manufactured later on, and they're cut out in different shapes. These small little shapes up there are 3D printed of this Boolean shape that's part of the bag. So that's kind of the realm uh, Zeitgeist is working in, and um, as I was introduced, I'm here for Foam Studio, uh, which is a funny thing because like us in Foam Studio, we are the same people, we are the same team. Um, but Foam Studio is a bit of a younger endeavor and is more like the, the studio that caters to clients' needs and sees itself as a design think tank, a, a visual development studio. Um, we are rather small, we're a little bit more than these seven people here, but like we're around 10. And we work with companies like Covestro, which is a big material um, company and do like visual explorations like this. We designed the IBM Think Conference in Las Vegas earlier this year, uh, which is all very much in 3D design space. Um, these are some automotive studies we did and, and kind of philosophical piece about an autonomous driving car that is dancing through the city. Title sequence for ADC Miami. Material explorations for Quadrat and more textual explorations for Munken. Uh, it's called Arctic Paper. And this is kind of what we do. We are um, heavily Cinema 4D based, but we use a lot of other platforms. And we just always put the creative process first and then see what tools we can use to, um, to make that happen, the vision that we are having. Um, so we are the commercial layer of an artistic studio and are very much in uh, visual research. My name. Just to say a few words about me as well, my name is Matthias Winkelmann. I'm uh, considering myself a director, designer, 3D artist. Sometimes I'm described as that guy who makes shit happen, uh, as I usually tend to work with different studios, different teams of people, and um, help them shape in some sort of ways. Going back in time a little bit, I, worked, uh, I joined Foam Studio in Berlin as a partner end of last year. Uh, before that, I was in London, worked for Man vs. Machine as head of 3D, where two years ago I had the honor to direct Versus, which if some of you are familiar with Cinema 4D and its history, two years ago that was that release piece 
So it's the same drill. Maxon approaches you. You have to make a release piece. And we created verses back then. Um, so yeah, let's, let's talk about influences. Let's talk about um, the actual project. And before I talk about it more, I actually want to show it, because maybe not everybody has seen it. Um, influences are these little guys here. And I kind of explained influences the term before, as this is the concept of what we did. We created these characters, and they are using the new features in Cinema 4D R20 to influence the world around them, the boring, ordinary, dull life that we're living. These little fellas make it more interesting and more colorful. And how that looks like, I'm going to show you now. It's a, it's a bit quiet in the beginning, so in this environment, it's always quite interesting. But let's have a look. So it all makes sense, doesn't it? If you had a little bit of that what the fuck moment now that you don't really know what you just saw, that means we did our job well, because that means we are creating something that you haven't seen before yet. And we are trying to strive that with everything we do to create visuals, uh, content that is unique and unseen in that sense. So how does this work? What did you just see? As I mentioned before, uh, this was the release piece for Maxon Cinema 4D R20. So how that works is that Maxon comes to you a few months before the official release and says, hey, let's do something together. Uh, we give you a little bit of money so that you can do something free, which is not commercial, and you can do whatever you want. And that's what you end up with. And it helps them because they have content on their screen and it helps us because we can have some good time doing it. Uh, when we received R20 a few months back um, and we saw what they added, we were quite blown away because uh, for me personally, it's the strongest release in years. Uh, there are a lot of features which, which are really um, amazing in what you can do with them. And it's, there's so much you can do, so it's really hard to, to actually explore that and exploit that in a way as well which gave us a little bit of this reaction, because on one hand, we were super excited and happy about this new release, but at the same time, utterly terrified, because we were the first ones to use it, and we were supposed to show off in some sort of way. Um, 
the result, the response for us, because we, are, we consider ourselves more as a designer's collective, an artist collective, and not a production house, uh, was to play, basically. And that's also the reason why we use Cinema 4D. But I'll talk a bit more about that later. Before I continue, I want to show you the making of. There's actually a proper making of of that as well, just to so, so you can see a few other people and, and how our studio looks like. We are a pretty small studio in Berlin, very cozy setup, and that's how we work. At foam, we are lured in most by things that are often overlooked. This curiosity is the root of our work. Influences is a film about drawing out the intrigue in the everyday and allowing it to humbly influence the world around us. For us it's a celebration of the creative process. Inspired by the concepts of Kami and animism, the idea that all things possess a spirit, we gradually reveal a vibrantly animated world that usually goes unseen. The more we watch, the more we see the influences that alter the life we live. Cinema 4D is the perfect companion to this way of seeing and experiencing the world. It encourages a design-centric and playful exploration, enticing us to take advantage of any new angles and unique perspectives that arise unexpectedly as we create. This is ant food. They made it sound good. We used a range of synthesis techniques like wave tables, physical modeling, granular, to create this exceptional world where these little guys live. Each scene has its own unique soundscape, and we approached every object as having their unique sonic persona, or sonic soul. With access to Maxon Cinema 4DR20 prior to its release, we had the pleasure of putting its new features through their paces. The newly implemented fields and volume measure, together with Maxon's tireless tweaking and improvement, makes C4DR20 a powerful and well-rounded bundle to express creativity at the highest level possible. There we go. Embracing a playful process is like uh, the, the outset that we wanted to embrace in the beginning of this project. Um, as I mentioned before, we are, we are designers, we are artists, we don't strive for creating high-end visual effects explosions or um, cars that collide together. We are much more interested in creating new things, new visuals, images that are unseen uh, and something that makes us curious as well. And that's why I'm, having, I'm putting on my Maxon propaganda hat now. That is why we're using Cinema 4D. Because ultimately, I've, I'm using a lot of 3D platforms and we've tried a lot of different things over the years. But for us, it's the platform which is the most intuitive, it's the fastest in creating something, and it's, it's the platform where you don't need to know what you're doing before you're starting. You can actually explore, you can sit down and play around and, and see what, what interests you, see what looks new to you, what makes you curious. And this is usually how we start. We, we have a rough idea, but we start random. So we just try out the new tools, we try out the volume measure and do simple things like that, meshing two spheres together, distracting one from the other. Or the new fields, um, with these you realize you can paint your own face onto a plane and let it grow, which is amazing and kind of fun. Or you just make collages of random objects. And I'm gonna show you a lot of images now. But basically these images are created on a daily basis in the team. Uh, as a creative process, and in this process we are trying to find out what we are interested in and what our idea and concept is behind our work. Uh, quite early on we were quite interested in characters, because we haven't done so, many so much characters before, so we created this really abstract sphere, like one of us, uh, which is balancing a milk chuck on top of its nose, and some more cute little guys, and more explorations in abstract characters. But quite quickly, we're, we were interested in, in the idea of characters that don't reference any like legs, eyes, or things like that, but they are more like weird shapes like this, but they sort of feel organic. And it's also a good base for, for trying out the volume measure, which, create, which is very handy in creating organic shapes. So in any, of, in any creative process, uh, my, my fortune cookie wisdom is that you should never forget to start curious. 
if you start a project, start a creative process, and you're not curious in the beginning, that means you already know what you're doing. And that means you'll probably do something which has been done before. Um, and that's, that's kind of key. That's why I'm showing you a lot of random stuff right now, because that's the curious process of trying out things, like objects being hijacked by some things, or how much do you actually need to make a character it can be very simple shapes, or weird teapot blobs that have legs. Um, and we just continue on this exploration with hijacking objects again here, or strange <laughs> renders like this, who we decided not to pursue because they have some slightly weird um, context. And, but there, you, f you realize very quickly in this process there's something interesting in there. There's something you enjoy watching because it's, it's, it's simple renders, it's viewport previews, um, but, but they kind of they, they have some fun element in it. And then also we tried out new features like the volume measure just now, or, or this guy is hijacking a blender, uh, volume meshing strange particle things behind it. Uh, or what comes next? Yeah, this guy is uh, specifically using fields to influence the plane underneath it that is then displaced into the surface. Uh, and all these things are, are conceptual creative tests, but at the same time they're technical tests because we are learning how we're using new features and what we can actually do with them. And we quite like the idea of these influencing uh, surfaces underneath, which we just saw in that one test. So we pursued that a bit more, cutting out shapes from uh, ordinary surfaces, having um, an office chair influencing the floor underneath it. And again, as I said before, these are daily outputs. These are like what the team is producing. Then the whole team can reflect about it and see if there's something, something the people like or that we respond well to. One thing we responded quite well to pretty early on was, uh, was this one here, which again is using the news fields uh, to just, it's a sphere in this case, not a character, it could be a character, but it's just like painting onto the surface and, and influencing its world around it. And there we go for a technical demonstration, but I'm keeping them really short because my purpose on this was that I'm just using 10 clicks because I just want to, I have a random idea and I just want to test it and, and throw it in my dailies folder and see if somebody else responds well to it. So to do something similar to what we just saw in the last example, if you use fields, you have a sphere, you can add a vertex color tag onto the plane underneath it, and then make that vertex color tag use fields. And now with a point object option, you can throw in that sphere, and then you, in the vertex color information, uh, you get the, uh, a color response depending on the proximity of that sphere object. And you animate it A to B, uh, like from, from the middle to the outside, you're animating it. And uh, the freeze option underneath, you can change to grow, which Glenn also showed before, which basically makes information on vertices grow outside, depending on the effect strength and the radius. And then you cr create things like that. Doesn't look too interesting yet, so you can add um, a noise option in the fields as well, and that can use 2D textures or volumetric noises or anything you can throw inside there, and that then influences the grow effect a little bit, so you get more shapes like this. And I, I think I have two more clicks, which I add a material, a colorizer uses the vertex color tag, and then maybe the last click is rendering it into your dailies folder, and you have something that is a test of something you're thinking about that you can save first and then think about it further later on. <coughs> At some point when you do all these random explorations, you need to rationalize. You, yeah, we're still a production company. We're still producing for clients as well, so we can't spend ages on just doing random things. Uh, so you want to come to a concept. So one of the early uh, concepts we created based on our explorations was this these dull environments, uh, what characters appear in, which we kind of referred to Cinema 4D tools. Uh, and then th those tools can create uh, nice, pretty things around it. And the dullness, these dull environments were literally the gray viewport in Cinema 4D, <laughs> which is empty in the beginning. And then you do some design work. You decide what characters could do, how could they look like, um, what could be some of the storylines we want to establish. Uh, like this guy cutting a hole into the surface. And uh, at the same time, you also continue production uh, while you're on the conceptual side of things. 
uh, which is this like a, just a kitchen one of the guys built, which actually uses material from the content browser in Cinema 4D, uh, which I think the guy who made it was quite happy about. Uh, some of the windows, they're, they're, very, um, they're very easy to customize to certain sizes and things, so you can use them if you want to create things like that. And then you test out the concept where you create one of these abstract characters that is just happily walking around on the surface. For a while, we also thought maybe they could come from objects, so an object transforms into something, becomes a character. And we just continually explored shapes, because that's actually a big part of what we do, is, is shape exploration, is shape design. Uh, we also 3D print quite a bit of s stuff. And these are all prototypes of weird little characters. Then at some point you want to decide. I found this image in uh, our dailies folder and it literally was named Get to Work, which I found quite charming. So we created another diagram in our process to refine more what we actually want to create. So we had these objects becoming abstract things, becoming abstract characters. And then again, Cinema 4D, you just jump in, you just build something out of it and you test it. It doesn't have to be because like all of these are just internal tests, so like they're not for, um, for the public, but it makes it easy for you to decide, is this actually something I want to build for the film? Is this some interesting creative idea? And it just makes it easy for you to refine that creative process without locking yourself in too early. Then these, this all this all volume measure basically. Um, so we were quite interested in the idea of them moving by transforming their shape. And then at some point you start panicking because you realize you only have a few weeks left and you still need to produce the whole thing. So you need to get a bit serious. So we do our serious design work. We do our art direction, which is kind of based on a, a film by Godard made in the USA, which was a color reference. Um, again, we, we design scenes we barely do storyboards, we just go straight in cinema and create stuff. Um, but you still, you, you decide on storylines, what could the water tap do? This guy over there was the first reference for that symmetry character you see in the film who is mirroring things constantly. Or uh, that one is just making things blow up around it. Um, and then others were like influencing textures around them. And at the same time, while we're doing production, this is production still basically creating one of these environments, but it's also design development because we're testing out color contrasts and see if there's something interesting and in how this shape down there pops out of the image. And by that, if you just trust that process, you evolve in some, into something that is quite unique and quite special and, and often surprises yourself because uh, you didn't know that you will get there in the end into this result. Uh, so we wanted to continue a bit further. We um, created this image just as a reference. This was actually made with Oculus Medium to just as a quick draft of, of like how we could expand in these dull environments. Um, some more abstract spherical or like shape lang landscapes in a way and more of these color contrast studies. More a guy makes funny shapes around him and that basically uh, concluded our diagram into a storyline that was based on we have real objects become abstract shapes, become characters, then do that influence thing on the environment slightly based on the visual appearance and the visual design of the character themselves. And this is something, this is hard to come up with on the first day of production if you didn't actually try out things and play it around. Like, I don't think you can sit down and, and come up with weird things like this that easily. And always there's the work to do, designing uh, environments, deciding on things, actually deciding which characters we, may, we will hero in the film because we made a lot and we just had a few spots left, and spending a considerable amount of time on working on the important details like this custom-made international power socket over there so that the piece can be used globally and nobody feels like they've been left out. <laughs> And again, Cinema 4D, you just render viewport previews. You can build your rigs or you can try out while you're doing it. Um, and while trying, you already set up scenes that are actually animatics for the final shots. 
And at the same time, we also still had to continue exploring what we can do with the new features so that we can give them the spot in the film they deserve. And one of the, t um, one of the early versions of this shot, um, which is all made with a VDB volume measure, um, it's, a pretty, it's a pretty complex setup, which I, I cannot describe in detail right now. But roughly saying, it's, a, it's like it's a geometry shape around the, the object, which is holding um, a noise field inside. So when you add a noise field into uh, a volume measure, it creates you a cubic volumetric noise. And if you, const you can constrain that by another object, which is a post-morph geometry around it, which is spinning. And this noise can also be animated. And you can also add a cloner set up inside this and subtract it from the whole thing. So you get a lot of multiple level, levels of geometry that is morphing into each other. I'm doing my 10 clips to come to, some, to something kind of similar to it. So volume measure. I mean, Glenn showed a few really good examples. Let's have a sphere. You throw it into a volume builder, which creates a voxel grid. Uh, voxels are, you can imagine them as three-dimensional pixels that have a certain size. So if I lower the size of these voxels, I get a more dense, uh, a dense information space, basically. And the volume measure, again, creates new geometry out of that voxel uh, grid I created. Now you're saying it looks exactly the same as when I started. It does right now, but the difference is, if I duplicate these two spheres, they're both in my voxel grid. They're actually part of the same thing now. So like I have seamless transitions between these two objects. And I can continue that play by, uh, in this case, uh, you see like here on the, on the right, you see all these objects which are underneath the volume builder. Um, I continue this play. I can just have many volume builders. I can have lo loads of these using the same information. So in this case, just make four spheres, offset a few of them, scale them bigger, and you can subtract objects from each other. So by this, I created a shell on, on top of that sphere. Um, which doesn't look that great on these edges there, but uh, then there are amazing add-ons like the smooth layer, which gives you, which smooths out the voxel information underneath it. And then now by just uh, 10 clicks, less than 10 clicks, I kind of created a geometry that is not constrained by traditional modeling workflows of I have to actually create polygons and, and, and all these things. That's sort of secondary in this way. If you could continue this further, you might arrive at something like this, which was one of the early tests, um, which consists of something what I just showed. It's just a MoGraph setup of dynamic spheres growing outwards, being dynamic, pushing themselves away from each other. And then that's duplicated, creates that shell on top of this. And as I said before, at some point you need to get serious because you're running out of time. But we never stop exploring. We never stop uh, designing while we produce. But there's this natural thing that at some point you realized um, you have to put the picture of a team member up in the scene at some point. Um, but you realize that everything you do now uh, falls into the same world because you designed, you, you decided on your design decisions and um, you created a world that these, these characters live in and it all comes together to a complete piece, I would say. And you arrive at that concept, as I said before, that, that uh, was part of that embracing that playful process in the beginning. These are some of the, um, the stills. We also had to produce a few print stills, which I think will be on, on these Maxon banners at some point. Um, this is also based on a, on a test with fields where we are using fields um, basically looking at the proximity to this pen and therefore creating a shape like this. And then, um, then it's being displaced outwards and smoothed out. And then a lot of that displacement structure is, um, is actually based on a substance. Uh, we used some substances from uh, Algorithmic, which have a direct bridge into Cinema 4D now as well. Spherify guy I mentioned before. Or things like this, uh, um, it's actually simply a, dis a displacer that is using a fur texture. So it's a really lightweight setup, uh, just with shitloads of polygons. And this guy is completely based on, on the volume measure that I mentioned before. So as, as people are coming and going here, I tend to show it twice. Um, if you don't mind, I'll play it again. <laughs>
Now the green screen is starting again, so it's going to be interesting, but at this point I want to give a big shout out to Antfood, who is the audio sound design studio that we worked with. They actually have an office in Amsterdam, so you could just go there now and say hello. Uh, also in New York and Sao Paulo, and they also embrace that playful process of recording their own voices singing la 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 la, which is heard in the end, uh, and using that as a base for their sound design. So they did a really amazing job. And if you want to know more from the technical th side of things, uh, we also released a few tutorials on YouTube um, explaining some of the techniques with the new features which we did. Um, five people didn't like this, so I can't guarantee it's amazing. I think this one nobody really li nobody disliked, so it might be better. This is about the field structure that we used. It's just really quick explanations, a bit more in detail what I did here today. And I'm happy to take a few questions. I'll do two myself. What renderer did we use? We reused Redshift. Sorry. Um, we are all Redshift. We are the whole studio set up on, on a GPU basis, and we, we love it. And the other question is if we did it all in Cinema 4D, and yes, of course. And I, I finish my presentation usually with one of the quotes I liked from YouTube uh, by Philip Valdez. I'm very thankful for his interpretation. And yeah, thank you very much.